Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, we're going to start our next session with Antoine Lacalvez talking about uh, what Bitcoin is used for. Hi, thanks for listening to me. I'm Antoine Lacalvez. I currently work at CoinMetrics where I spend my days looking at blockchains and trying to extract insights from them. Uh, prior to that, I worked at uh, blockchain.info and launched uh, p2sh.info, which is uh, an amateur website collecting what I find are interesting statistics about Bitcoin, like how many Bitcoin use Petroscript hash or other uh, exotic uh, things. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a bit of an interesting topic, is not only what is Bitcoin used for, but how can we know what is Bitcoin used for? One of the property of Bitcoin is that it's a, a permissionless network. We don't know who uses Bitcoin. We hope that we don't get, we don't have the information to uh, de-anonymize people and uh, anybody can participate. Yet, we still want to gather insights as to how people use it because it is useful for understanding it better and, and designing around it. It has been, for example, uh, mentioned by Peter Willey that it is interesting to know, for example, how multi-sig or how often complex scripts are used because it helps inform design decisions of the protocol and also on an economics level it is interesting to for valuation purposes for uh, being able to talk and, and uh, direct bitcoin to know what it is used for and um, there's been of course many uh, ways to think about it uh, an article uh, published uh, two years ago by nick carter and has to fly about just went about that and more in the aspect of the philosophical views of bitcoin is it a payments network is it a store of value is it actually that the interest is not Bitcoin, but the blockchain behind it? Uh, is it a reserve currency or just a new asset class? Uh, and and it, these approaches are very valuable, and it's actually what often people talk about. They use, uh, they use what I would call like a top-down approach. They view Bitcoin as an, an object, a bit abstract. And then what I want to do is actually go the opposite, go the bottom-up approach and think of what can we learn about Bitcoin, not from uh, physical purposes, but more from looking at the data, which is wh what I do daily. And over the years, I've been looked at uh, how people transact and the patterns that we can find. Uh, I collected a collection of, uh, I think, or interesting insights as to what people do with it and, and how, what are the techniques that we can use to try to understand. And I think combining the two approaches of bottom up as to, uh, you know, uh, do people t think of the store value or payments network, and also how do you actually use it in real life, combining these two help get a better understanding of it. So one of the first example, and I'm going to start a bit historically, is to think of uh, when Bitcoin was launched, there was no pricing, which seems a bit uh, odd now, but when Bitcoin launched, it was just Bitcoin people by mining, getting 50 Bitcoins per block, and trying kind of hard at the time to find other people to transact with. And when uh, people transact in Bitcoin, they create what we call outputs, is basically like banknotes or coins, and these outputs have a value. And an interesting metadata which is leaked when people create Bitcoin transactions is just the, the value of the output, and more precisely, what precision levels they use. Did they say in one Bitcoin, or 1.01 Bitcoin, 1.005 Bitcoin? And analyzing this over time in the early history of Bitcoin, we can actually, without knowing, well, we can estimate because we are cheating because we know exactly when Mondox launched, but we can actually spot it on, on the chart. Um, before, so in the early years of Bitcoin, first we can see there's few transactions because the network was bootstrapping, there were not a lot of people around, but also they only used, almost most majority of the time, around less than one Bitcoin or 50 Bitcoin. But whenever uh, this happened, people started using transactions that were not multiples of Bitcoin, so 1.5, or lower precision. And the drop happened exactly on, actually on, on July 14th, 2010, and Mongox publicly launched on the 17th. So I don't know if they had a testing period before, but the alignment shows that actually when Bitcoin got its first pricing information or where a marketplace where you can exchange it for dollars, people stopped using Bitcoin for Bitcoins, but using sending Bitcoins for dollars, for example, $100. And when you price it that way, then you start using more precision. And as time went on and the price of Bitcoin uh, augmented, they had to use more and more precision. When you send, for example, a dollar and a Bitcoin is at 10 cents, you just need, you know, uh, 10 Bitcoins. 
But if you send one dollar when Bitcoin is at fifty dollars, then you need two decimals, and therefore the red line drops. And at some point, people started using the full precision available, so uh, it's the, the all eight, eight decimals. And the first time this happened was actually years after Bitcoin launched that people went down this precision. I haven't got to the bottom of what exactly triggered this jump right there. Still a bit of a mystery, but it is interesting to see that just the base information of what is the amount that people use can reveal when did they stop using Bitcoin for Bitcoin and using Bitcoin denominated in another currency. Another uh, interesting tidbit is uh, Satoshi Dice. So for those that don't know or don't remember, Satoshi Dice was a very popular service that offered a very simple premise. You, you send Bitcoin to an address and you have 48% chance of getting twice the money back. So you, technically you lose money, but you know, some people don't mind and play it along. And thankfully for us, in the future, they used what are called vanity addresses. So all the addresses were in one dice and then the probability of getting your money back. So one dice 48 and you know, other levers would give you 48% chance of getting your money back. And looking at all the addresses and all the outputs that sent to a Satoshi Dice address, we can clearly see the huge rise of the activity and they clearly super clicky went to using 40% of Bitcoin's uh, available transaction, or not available, but making 40% of Bitcoin transactions. And when Satoshi Dice launched, Bitcoin was breaking daily transaction records every, nearly every day. Another thing we can spot uh, is when this banned uh, US players from using the service, they got in trouble with you know, legal organizations. And it was in, in May 2013, and we can clearly see the drop. And after that is a combination, the, the drop in the activity of Satoshi Dice is a combination of both uh, the other use cases on the network growing up, because this is a, a relative chart, so the transaction count was relatively constant, and also them moving off chain due to rising transaction fees and, and competing uh, for block space, because you know, these services are quite sensitive to blocks, um, to fees. Another aspect of Bitcoin, which is often talked about, is store value. And one way, one of the many ways we can look at it is Bitcoin as a collectible. So whenever there's a, a press article or a news story about Bitcoin, usually, you know, it's kind of hard to get a picture of Bitcoins, but physical Bitcoins are very convenient for journalists. And you will find these round yellow coins with a big B on them. And these are Cassius coins. So they were created in, in 2011, sold between 2011 and 2013. And thankfully for us again, the full list of these coins was made, of the addresses was made public. So we can track the balance over time of these addresses. And I've also added BTC, China, Bitcoin China uh, physical coins, which are a bit different. Is that much that first they're made of actual silver, not just, you know, um, value, very little metal. And also the Bitcoins in them come directly from mining rewards. So they have no history, which in theory should make them more valuable, but in practice it's not the case. And one thing we can clearly notice is there's people that, there's at least you know, 50,000 Bitcoins, which is nothing to, to sneeze at in these uh, coins, but also there's a slow trickle down of these coins over time, people claiming them, even though they probably could get more value selling these coins as is, because there's a, a, collect, it's a collectible, so it has more value. You can sell a one Bitcoin coin for 1.5 or maybe 1.2 or 1.2 Bitcoins. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the prices, but you can get a good premium. Still, people claim them, so I don't know exactly why I would have to ask them. Uh, but it is an interesting thing to, to notice. Um, another aspect is uh, more on a cheap payment or you know, uh, PayPal, decentralized PayPal uh, aspect. So blockchain on info, which full disclaimer I used to work at, um, has a service where you can have a Bitcoin wallet without having to download a full node, install everything. And you can transact on mobile, on the web, it's very convenient. Uh, it's oriented towards non-sophisticated users because it's very easy to set up. And uh, thankfully as well, for historians, we, we don't have the use cases where we don't, can't get data. That's you know, a selection bias. We can see how much of the Bitcoin transactions were made by this service. So it doesn't include, it includes all the transactions made by uh, the retail users, the users of the wallet. It also includes transactions made by people using the API. So we should see that as a, a, super, a maximum estimation of the actual value of people using these web wallets. Uh, but we can see that at some point, 50% of the network was the activity, or, or at least on transaction count, uh, was driven by people using Bitcoin in quite a, a casual way, I would say, even though people could have a lot of Bitcoins in them. 
they were probably not serious about security to store them in, in, a web, in a web wallet, but it is very practical. And we can still see that to this day, it is one of the largest transactors. So one of the ways Bitcoin is used for is you know, a convenient way to pay for things by users that are not sophisticated or at least are sophisticated enough to not to put maybe a small amount of Bitcoins in a web wallet and keep the rest maybe uh, on the side. Another way, another on-chain information that we can use is uh, looking at what type, the, well, the script types used by outputs. So the main, the majority of Bitcoin transactions are just, you have a, a public key, a private key, you make a signature and you can spend the money. But the only way so far to use more complex uh, signature, uh, complex, uh, including more complex policies is what goes pay to script hash. So it was introduced in 2012. And what we can see or estimate is there's two main use cases. One, we can see in the early days, and, uh, and see a huge jump in how many Bitcoins are stored by such outputs is when Zappo, instead of storing their coins in normal public keys, moved to a more custodian friendly three out of five multi-sig signature setup uh, and moving a, a large amount of Bitcoins that way. But another one uh, which uh, goes contrary to what I just said about big pay to script hash being a way to use complex custodian setups is the introduction of Segwit in, in August 2017 where we saw a huge increase in the number of Bitcoins and the activity of pay to script hash, but not because people were using it as a way to do multi-sig or this kind of stuff, but just because it was the only backwards compatible way of using the, the consensus changes introduced by Bitcoin. So even though by design, by default, you would think that, oh my God, a lot of custodians must be getting into crypto if pay to script hash, which is mostly used multi-sig, increases in value. When you look deeper and look at timing, it's just, that it's the only backwards compatible way of using SegWit. This is one of my favorite tidbit, uh, because one of the questions about protocol development, and one that was actually raised at the Socratic meetup yesterday, was how, how quickly do economic nodes upgrade? Because it's a question when you, when you have a soft port, for example, you want to give enough leeway for economical nodes to upgrade, so economical nodes are peer-to-peer -peer nodes that run the Bitcoin software, but also uh, emit transaction. So they are stakeholders in the network, a bit more higher grade than nodes that do not emit transactions because they pay the miners to include their transactions. And it's very hard. You can monitor the peer-to-peer -peer network and see what versions the node broadcast, but it's really hard unless you're running maybe civil attacks to identify which of these nodes are economical actors. But in uh, 2015, one change was introduced to Bitcoin that created basically a barrier. Old nodes were making transactions a specific way, which is not using lock times, which is a feature that allows to specify that the transaction is only valid after a certain height. But after this commit was introduced in, in late 2014, Bitcoin Core software was producing transactions using this feature. And it was a unique opportunity to observe how quickly did economic nodes upgrade. So the change was introduced in 2014. So in a Bitcoin core development process, changes are added every day and people are free to run them whenever they want. But there's a, a cadence of releases. I think it's biannual um, of uh, the more so stable and tested version of the software. Uh, so, and it happened in, in mid 2016, 2015. And what we can see people, the, nearly the day after the commit was introduced, were running this change in production with actual money, without it, I mean, it was been tested before being introduced to Bitcoin, but still the whole package was not as thoroughly tested as the later release. And we can also measure how long it took for people, for the ex other nodes, economic nodes, to migrate from this version, for the older versions to this one. And it took roughly, uh, roughly six months. And uh, one of the proposals for soft forks that was recently put out said that it, we should take, wait two years for all this, or one or two years for nodes to update. And this shows that at least in 2016, we could have waited six months. It would have been maybe a tight schedule, but at least six months is how long it would take to some economic nodes, most of the economic nodes to upgrade. What is not pictured is that may, there may be many nodes that transacted before that haven't upgraded, but if you are running a node that broadcasts transaction and do not upgrade in five years, maybe you, deserve not to be included in, in counts of you know, active users, because you know, probably not running SegWit in, in this kind of, of transfers. 
another way that people use Bitcoin is the blockchain not Bitcoin kind of thing. Well, this one is a bit different. So this is Tether, the uh, famous stable coin. And uh, the original way it was usable was using Bitcoin due to its uh, security assurances, using the Omni layer or Omni protocol. It's a sort of colored coin protocol. Uh, and Tether is by far the largest asset on this platform. And we can identify of all the Bitcoin transactions, which one actually do not move Bitcoins, but move Tether. And uh, so this chart just showed that as a percentage, it's a baseline of around 5% of Bitcoin transactions, which at least, which are not about Bitcoin, but about second layer assets. And even at, at times there's spikes um, when it goes much higher. So in the future, we might see this specific use case of Tether go away due to, for example, the introduction of Tether that you can transact on, on Ethereum, Tron, and many other chains, uh, Liquid as well, which is still technically on Bitcoin. Uh, but it is yet another highlight of you know, the many varieties of how people use Bitcoin or just actually use Bitcoin as a proxy to get uh, insurance guarantees that you cannot get on maybe on other currencies to transact uh, other assets. Uh, another cool data point or data set is looking and another th thing that people leak when they transact and that we can uh, use to inform our decisions and our knowledge of Bitcoin's users is when are the transactions made. So this chart shows the average transactions broadcast per second on the Bitcoin network. It's averaged out over eight hours, so that is much more smooth to look at. And we can see there's two cycles. There's a, a daily cycle, so people seem to transact more uh, during the day, European time, than the night, which means that some Bitcoin is sleep. And also there's, uh, as highlighted by the red bands, another pattern that the weekends are less active than the weekdays. So it seems that some of us do go outside in the weekend. <laughs> and and uh, so it is interesting because we can think of this uh, wave peaks and throughs as a mixture distribution of the people that live in the US, the people that live around Europe, the Middle East and Asia. And an analysis that I haven't done, but I think would be extremely interesting it is try to find what mixture of uh, assuming a base distribution of activity that when people are at 3 a.m., nobody is transacting, and at midday, most people are transacting in a given time zone, is what is the time zone makeup of Bitcoin users, and how did it change over time? Because there's this theory that maybe it shifted to Asia at some point, it started in the US or Europe, moved to Asia, but this would be one way to, to experiment it. And another way, it would be to look at the holidays. So the first, uh, red zone is Christmas of last, this last Christmas, and the new one is New Year's Eve. And we can clearly see that th this happened not on weekends, but yet there were much lower activity than other days. Uh, and I've not to look at it because this year's uh, Chinese New Year is a bit, there's other things with uh, the coronavirus outbreak, but interesting to see if other holidays in other cultures also have an impact on Bitcoin and can we see change over the time? Maybe Chinese New Year was not a huge, um, didn't have a huge impact on Bitcoin in 2011, but maybe it has an impact more now, and it would help us inform where do people that use Bitcoin live. And another thing is that there's a constant background activity, which could be the result of this mixture, but there's still periods of time where most of the world is asleep, or at least you know, waking up or going to sleep. This seems to indicate there's a constant background of automated transactions automated services that, that use Bitcoin. We can also look at in the store of value hypothesis. You know, if you have a bank account, which, and I don't know anything about what, what they are, but I see that one is used frequently and one is never touched, I can guess that one is checking and one is savings. And we can do a bit the same with Bitcoin. We can look at the age of each component of the UTXO set, band them together, and look at how it changes over time. Um, of course, there's are at the top, the, the very old coins, older than four years old, which is constantly growing. It could, this would include lost coins. If you lose your coins, you will never be able to move them again. And also very long-term holdings. And at the bottom, uh, the, bl uh, the blue band is the coins that are younger than one year. So you would assume they are more actively moved, or actively traded. And you can see that the supposition is that the blue band seems to be relatively constant in notional amount, but that uh, the other older bands or trenches of the supply are just growing up over time that we tend to confirm, or at least go toward the idea that, idea that Bitcoin is more 
now thought as a store of value than before. But it's also a sort of a bias because as Bitcoin is getting older, it is more frequently probable that coins are older than four years. When Bitcoin was four years in one day, only Satoshi's coins were four years old. So it still more, need more time to, to see if this is true or not, but it's still an interesting data point to, to notice. Of course, something that has dominated a lot of these talks and our talks in this uh, expo today is exchanges and custodians. And while Bitcoin is pseudonymous, uh, you can, with a somewhat relatively small amount of effort, you can identify who is who on the chain, at least exchanges, because they have idiosyncratic way of moving Bitcoin and you can interact with them and they don't change their wallet that often. So what we did at CoinMetrics is identify a lot of exchanges, not all of them, because there's you know, a lot of them, but at least ones that we think are representative of a large amount of the activity. And we looked at how often, what, what share of the Bitcoin transactions do they represent? And it turns out it is significant, but also very valuable. Um, so of course, the 2018 bull, uh, bull market was quite high, but this actually is more an artifact of what happened during 2017 with the high fees, because exchanges after uh, the run-up had to clean up the wallet when the fees came down, they were finally able to, to clean up the wallet and, and uh, collect deposits into uh, larger chunks of money. But it is still interesting to see that at least 5% of all transactions daily are made by exchanges. But this is a lower bound because exchanges often use batching. So one exchange transaction actually covers maybe 10 or 100 users getting money from the exchange. So you, you should take these numbers with, with a bit of, of caution, but it's still interesting to see. I, I show transactions just so that it's more comparable with all the other figures. And then Satoshi dies, I use transaction and, and, and blockchain info as well. Another thing is, as I mentioned in the first slide, the amounts that people use leak a lot of information. And you would think that you know, Bitcoin high value is used by to make large transactions, but more than half of the transactions are below 0.01 Bitcoin, so roughly, uh, what is it, $70? So, or yeah, $90 now. So a majority of the Bitcoin activity is actually done with very low amounts of, I mean, relatively low amounts of money, despite that, the fact that only two years ago, the fees were maybe $30 to make one transaction. So people thought that this activity would have disappeared, that you know, high fees would remove low activity, basically call the users of Bitcoin towards uh, the high value transactions, but it turns out it, it's not the case. Um, and there's also fewer transactions, large amounts, Another thing to look at is how um, people that use Bitcoin make traded transactions. With Bitcoin, you can, I can pay one person, but in one transaction, I can also pay maybe not the whole assembly here, or maybe a large transaction, but a lot of people in one go. And we can look at how often is this the case that the transaction pays out multiple people at once, or that we estimate that it pays out multiple people at once. And it's been remarkably stable over time. We don't see on this chart when the fees went super high despite the fact that you would assume that it would be more, it is more economical to send to batch payments than to not batch payment. But it turns out that it's not the case. Um, and one reason why it could be that as an individual, batching payment, while it might be nice, is not really practical. I would have to wait to do two payments at once to pay two things. But if I buy my coffee in the morning and I buy a t-shirt in the afternoon, then I would have to buy the two at the same time or delay payments. So it's not something that happens, which could be a way to think that a lot of individuals use Bitcoin. Businesses are more uh, likely to use batching than users. And this is maybe, so this is my final slide and a lesson I like to, to show is, so in 2017, Bitcoin fees went super high due to high congestion. So we can see this. The red line is, you know, the fee estimation, like how much you should pay to get your transaction included quickly. And the blue line is how busy was the Bitcoin network. So it's capped at 100%. And for a period of time, Bitcoin was full. Basically, you couldn't make a transaction without paying an outrageous amount of money. And it came down and went up again. But you can notice that the fees stayed much lower on the second time than the first time. And one reason why, because I was on the front line of that, is that a lot of people that transact went around and decided we need to better estimate how we pay fees and how we uh, pay miners to include our transactions so that the next time around, we don't pay too much. And another thing is that the baseline went considerably lower. Basically, even though 
transaction use, um, usage was roughly the same, the fees people paid for the same uh, block, available block space was much, much lower due to the increased competition in uh, uh, fee uh, algorithms. But at the same time, batching didn't move at all. But you would think that people would batch transactions and use better fee estimation, but turned out that only used one of that. And it's one of the insights that we can gather by looking at the on-chain data. It sometimes is counterintuitive that you know one thing would work and not the other one. But it's, I think, one way to, to enhance the uh, debates and the ideas that we can have about what is Bitcoin and how it can be used just by you know, looking at the numbers sometimes it is quite refreshing. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, um, So we have time for about two questions or three questions, if, Evan, if you'd like to line up, or left or right, thank you. Hi, the little the blip that happens around, um, in April of 2011, <coughs> that's when I became aware of Bitcoin because my daughter said, please buy me some Bitcoin. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding was, because you said it was a mystery what happened at that point, my understanding was is there was an article in Wired or Slashdot or something that just brought a lot of people into the space. Mm -hmm. I think it was your second or third slide. Yeah. Um, so, um, did you? Yeah, it's fine. No, it's back probably. What? Which one, sorry? No, no, it's two, two or three slides back. Right? The other way. It's like your second slide. Oh, second slide, yeah. Yeah, is it this one? Yes, so, uh, yeah, so that point I think there was an article that, that, we, that caused that to happen. Yeah, but my theory is could have been four sets. So four sets were an easy way for users to get Bitcoin. And so basically you would go on a web page and maybe have a capture or something and get some tiny amount of money out of it. But because this blue line is, you know, the, the payments that use a very high precision. So usually these tend to be lower value payments, but I haven't looked at it too deep. Pe pe people were using Mt. Gox then, and so Mt. Gox was doing just arbitrary precision transactions, because they had a lot of change addresses. Mm. So uh, yeah, it could be, I haven't looked too much into it. Okay, so. thank you. Uh, yeah, I really loved your uh, work on, on the holidays and, and uh, trying to understand Bitcoin users based on all of this transaction data. Uh, and I wanted to propose uh, an observation that I had, which is also when uh, Game of Thrones episodes were live, oh. uh, there was a huge drop uh, uh, in uh, <laughs> Bitcoin <laughs> transactions. Uh, and I think there are some interesting additional things beyond holidays that are, are the same sort of global phenomenons where, you know, large uh, uh, amounts of people are tweeting and not less uh, amounts of people are, are uh, trading Bitcoin. So. Actually, a, a very good observation because one of the problems with interpreting this data is getting the priors on where are the people located. Yeah. And like TV shows, they're quite short and they broadcast synchronously if I'm wrong, on the East Coast time or European yeah. time. Or, I mean, I don't know if there was uh, Game of Thrones in Asia, but, but yeah, that could be an interesting things to look at. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, last question. Oh, wait, no. Oh. Um, Coinbase was excluded from your data. Why is that? Yeah, so uh, we all spent some work on uh, getting the Coinbase core storage. Uh, it's a long story, but Coinbase is an old exchange, and they went through a lot of analysis storing their Bitcoins and move them quite often, which makes it kind of hard to track compared to other exchanges which have one or two addresses to store Bitcoin. You don't see an address that has like half a million Bitcoin because that would be Coinbase. They split it into much, many smaller chunks and you have to patch it all together, which takes quite a bit of effort. But one of the next release at Coinmetrics will include Coinbase's uh, Bitcoin's holdings. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>